My name is Dr. Sue Ghosh. I'm a GYN oncologist. Um, I've been in practice in North County since 2010. And what I want to talk about specifically is robotics and gynecology. And it's, it's basically adding on what Dr. Fear said and a lot of the generalities that you can say about robotic surgery. And I think that um, the, the biggest take home point already is that you have to have an experienced robotic surgeon. Um, and for me, I was fellowship trained in robotic surgery, and I think for G1 oncology, that's, that's generally the case. So I did two years of robotic surgery under the supervision of my attending physicians. Um, and the other thing is picking the appropriate candidates for having those procedures. And I think that's where, at least in gynecology, um, we're getting into a little bit of a heated discussion about simple hysterectomies, oophorectomies, tubal ligations, things that can be done very easily laparoscopically where a lot of gynecologists or some gynecologists are not only being trained with those procedures, but that that's becoming how they're doing those procedures using the robot platform instead of uh, routine laparoscopy. So specifically for gynecology, I just wanted to talk very uh, generally about um, anatomy, reasons that we do surgery in GYN, surgical options for those conditions, and specifically talking about robotics and uh, GYN surgery. This is very basic. I'm just going to go over this. We all know that. But the, the conditions that are usually treated by surgery in gynecology include fibroids. I think what um, is important anatomically speaking for family practitioners to, to know is that the uterus essentially has three layers, um, the, the endometrium, the myometrium, and the serosa, and that depending on the anatomic position of fibroids and the symptoms, that will dictate how fibroids are treated. Um, pelvic masses, specifically ovarian cysts, cysts of um, the tubes, um, abnormal bleeding, whether that be dysfunctional uterine bleeding, perimenopausal bleeding, postmenopausal bleeding um, that occurs um, persistently even after having negative endometrial sampling. Endometriosis, which essentially is um, having the endometrial cells found outside the uterus, but from a um, uh, a surgical description, it's almost like somebody has taken rubber cement and essentially poured it inside the pelvis and then expects the, the patient um, has symptoms from that and then from a surgically, um, from a surgical aspect, that can be a very difficult thing to deal with. Um, pelvic floor disorders, we're not talking about cystoceles and rectoceles. Specifically, um, I'm going to focus a little bit on uh, vaginal vault prolapse um, with um, patients that have and have not had hysterectomies. Uh, Precancer, that can include cervical dysplasia, uh, endometrial hyperplasia, specifically with um, atypia that has a 30% chance of having concomitant endometrial cancer, and cancer in and of itself. So for GYN, that would include um, thinking about cervical cancer, endometrial cancer, and at times early ovarian cancer. So when you're talking about treatment options for fibroids, obviously if people aren't symptomatic, you can die with fibroids and nobody would ever know. So if fibroids aren't symptomatic, that's something that you can just observe. Thinking about medical options for shrinking fibroids, you definitely have medications that can hormonally manipulate women, um, inducing menopause and thus shrinking fibroids. Uterine artery embolization is a way to shrink fibroids as well by stopping the blood flow. Um, that can be done sometimes by gynecologists, but usually by radiologists. Now talking about surgical options for fibroids, uh, one is resection, so that, that is specifically talking about uh, fibroids found in the endometrium. Um, that can be done hysteroscopically. Um, specifically removing or shelling out fibroids themselves that are found um, near the surface of the uterus or the muscle wall of the uterus. Um, that is generally done when women want to retain fertility um, and or preserve their uterus. And obviously hysterectomy, removal of the uterus itself. Endometriosis, uh, generally, again, medically, we talk about hormonal manipulation with oral contraceptives and pain medication. Uh, medical treatment has always included Lupron. And then surgical treatment um, can include um, resection of endometriosis, um, ablation using cautery. Um, hysterectomy, you know, for me, the, ultimately the treatment for endometriosis is um, lack of estrogen. So if you're going to do a hysterectomy for endometriosis, that's not necessarily going to stop somebody from having pain if they still have their ovaries in, in situ. 
So for pelvic floor disorders, um, we can always talk about Kegel exercises, a pessary, but uh, surgical options can always include hysterectomy for prolapse, um, specifically vaginal vault suspension, um, which can be done vaginally, abdominally, laparoscopically, and now um, more recently, um, gynecologists are, are starting to perform this using the Da Vinci platform. Um, and bladder suspensions, that's not something that we would consider um, from a robotic perspective. So specifically in GYN malignancies, and again, the data, I didn't, I didn't um, spend a lot of time talking about the num I'm not going to spend a lot of time talking about the numbers, but it generally is the same in the fact that for endometrial cancer and cervical cancer, we do use the robotic platform a lot for those surgical staging procedures, but there are no randomized controlled trials looking at a comparison of specifically laparoscopy and robotic surgery. I mean, we've had a lot of studies that have shown that if you're going to compare open surgery to robotic surgery, then there are definite benefits, those equal benefits of doing laparoscopic surgery. There have been some small trials that have looked at the number of lymph nodes that can be taken out when you're doing endometrial cancer staging um, or cervical cancer staging, and at times those numbers are um, higher but not necessarily statistically significant. There is data in G1 oncology looking at morbid obesity um, and that there is some benefit specifically with endometrial cancer patients uh, talking about the time of surgery, um, the length of surgery, um, using the robotic platform compared to laparoscopy, but there, there have not, there's not a ton of data showing that there's such a great benefit with all of the negativity that people talk about regarding robotics, specifically um, the learning curve and the economics of it, that we can definitely say that this is something that um, needs to happen um, in the future. But surgical options for GYN malignancy, if we're talking about early stage cervical cancer, um, somebody that wants to preserve their fertility, removing their cervix and keeping their uterus in situ, a trachelectomy. Um, that's something that I've seen case reports um, theoretically being done um, robotically, but it has been shown to be done laparoscopically. Now, with the radical hysterectomy, that's what we do for cervical cancers that are less than four centimeters um, and removal of the pelvic lymph nodes. In G1 oncology, it's, it's been a standard that we do a lot of open surgery for cervical cancer, um, open radical hysterectomies, um, including the staging that's done with removal of lymph nodes. And Laparoscopic radical hysterectomies has, it's something that has never really caught on. And even during um, my training, I, that wasn't even a case that we necessarily did. Um, we, we, we were taught about it. Um, we had seen that there are other places in the world where obviously they don't have necessarily the robotic platform that they would do this laparoscopically. But generally, if we were going to do um, a radical hysterectomy, it would either be open or it would be robotic. And there is some data looking at robotic hysterectomy in, in cervical cancer showing that obviously if we don't have that group of physicians that we're going to do this laparoscopically, that there is a benefit in using the robot. And then we have the um, additional uh, positive aspects of minimally invasive surgery in um, helping those patients with early cervical cancer. So in talking about um, endometrial cancer, that includes uh, removal of the uterus, removal of the ovaries and tubes, and um, a lymph node removal, including in the, in the pelvic area and the um, periortic area. Um, it, Talking about ovarian cancer, laparoscopy in and of itself in ovarian cancer is something that we're still considering. And since, unfortunately, with ovarian cancer, 75 to 80 percent of women are found in a stage three, um, it's it's very unlikely that the the basic and ovarian cancer patient is not something that we would consider uh, robotic surgery on. Still in this country, hysterectomy is the most common female surgery. There's over 600,000 that are done um, annually. Whether they're indicated or not, that's a question. Um, definitely advances in minimally invasive surgery for hysterectomy, um, specifically laparoscopy, but it's the same learning curve that Dr. Fear talked about regarding G uh, general surgeries, that there are a lot of GYN surgeons that feel comfortable doing hysterectomies open, but have not had the laparoscopic training. And now that this platform has, has come about, that they feel more comfortable doing minimally invasive hysterectomies for those women that they feel are deemed necessary. So surgical approaches, as I said, open. Minimally invasive, some people forget vaginal surgery. And I think that in March, when that ACOG, um, the American College of OBGYN, that um, statement came out, it definitely ended with a lot of um, fury in the fact that 
um, talking about conventional laparoscopic surgery and even vaginal hysterectomies, we forget that those are minimally invasive things to do for hysterectomy as well, and that from a cost perspective, they're definitely much cheaper. Um, but the, the, the subspecialties in gynecology definitely came to the forefront to at least talk about very specific um, patients where the robotic platform is helpful um, in infertility, um, specifically doing certain types of myomectomy, and in GYN oncology, talking about, again, the uterine cancer and cervical cancer staging procedures. Um, again, myomectomy, this is something that not a lot of people would necessarily do laparoscopically unless you were in a teaching institution, and even then, the majority of myomectomies were done in an open way. Uh, 40,000 are done um, annually, um, and thus, those people that are trained to do robotic surgery and infertility or even benign gynecologists, um, fertility preservation and using the platform because of the positive things that Dr. Fear has already talked about, specifically the suturing. So talking about women that want to fer preserve fertility, doing a laparoscopic myomectomy versus a robotic myomectomy, they're saying that the suturing is more precise, that you're able to get more um, strength in the layers and doing it in a more precise way through the robotic platform rather than doing it uh, laparoscopically and that there is a benefit. So there is that cohort of patients that robotic surgery. And this is, this is all stuff that, that Dr. Fear had just said, which we know, which is talking specifically about laparoscopy, blood loss, complications, faster recovery, less scarring, and thinking about the incisions um, for GYN surgery. There's always the open vertical, the open transverse, and, and, and doing it laparoscopically with the small keyhole incisions. Um, and the visual system, again, the three-dimensional versus a really good two-dimensional um, view. Is there a difference? I think, again, it comes down to, in gynecology, why are you doing it? And in certain ways, when I'm doing robotic surgery, if somebody has endometriosis and they have stage four endometriosis, which means that everything is stuck everywhere, their posterior cul-de-sac is completely obliterated, their ovaries and tubes are completely stuck behind the uterus, and I need to, basically the goal of that surgery is to normalize anatomy for somebody that still wants to get pregnant, Having the robotic platform in that I have the extra um, ability to move my wrists and copy those movements that I'm doing outside the patient, in the patient, I found to be beneficial. But again, looking at data, that hasn't been proven to be beneficial in an overall you know, quality of life perspective. But I know that I've had benefit in using the robotic platform versus uh, laparoscopy in those patients particularly. Um, and again, those are, that's what it looks like. Um, those are what the hand grips look like um, at the robotic, uh, the, the surgeon console. Um, and again, the endo wrist, which is what allows us to move more like a human. It has seven degrees of freedom and, and, and like I said, in certain situations is, is incredibly important. Um, the instruments are quite small um, and there's a variety of instruments. So for general surgery, urology and GYN, there's a lot of different things to use. So specifically with robotic surgery, again, Dr. Fear has already talked about the visualization and instrumentation and dexterity, et cetera. Ergonomics, I do have something to say about ergonomics and gynecology. There are a lot of women that do gynecology. I'm five foot two. So the largest patient that I've ever operated on had a BMI of 63. That would have been impossible for me to do laparoscopically. My arm length is only this long. So I would not have been able to manipulate the uterus and operate on the patient at the same time. So for me, in the fact that endometrial cancer is a disease of the morbidly obese and that the average BMI that I see for this is anywhere between 39 and 45, being able to sit at the console and to be able to stage someone accurately and do the lymph nodes it's helpful. I mean, it's helpful for the patient that I can do it generally more quickly, robotically, than laparoscopically for specifically morbidly obese patients, and that ergonomically as a surgeon, I guess my, my career will be longer <laughs> based on it. Um, so potential patient benefits, again, this is, this is a rehash, so I'm not going to necessarily say anything. But the big thing is that specifically for robotics, you can't say these are robotic um, patient benefits because they're the same benefits that happen with laparoscopy. So the jury is still out. But again, for GY indications for robotics, if you're thinking about um, why we do surgery for cervical cancer, I do believe that robotic hysterectomies are better than open because of the benefits of MIS over open surgery. But um, for endometrial cancer, the jury is still out because it is expensive. Um, but I think in looking at those patients that are incredibly morbidly obese and comparing laparoscopy to robotics is a field of research that needs to be done, both um, 
in uh, a very sort of randomized control uh, trial manner because most of our data is looking retrospectively or in a cohort sort of study, um, specifically vagin and vaginal or uterine prolapse. So the one thing about prolapse surgery, vaginal vault surgery, is that there's the whole conversation about mesh, and I'm not going to, that's, that's not what I'm going to talk about, but talking about suturing um, the mesh and, and doing that laparoscopically, those surgeries can take four or five hours. Um, doing a laparoscopic prolapse surgery. And specifically with robotics, the platform makes it easier. So if you're somebody that you're skilled in laparoscopy and you want to try to do this um, in a more efficient manner, there is some data out there saying that robot-assisted laparoscopic sacral copalpexies, which is suspending the vagina to the sacrum, um, is something that is um, a potential uh, benefit of using the robotic platform. Um, Again, with endometriosis, I feel that the visualization and the ability to move with the robot has benefit. Um, for fibroids, um, maintaining fertility and having the, the ability of strength of suture um, and precision of suture to be able to remove fibroids in, in women that want to retain uh, fertility is something that is important and is a potential benefit of the robotic surgery. And in obesity, um, I feel if you're going to compare like morbidly obese patients with laparoscopy versus robotics, there are potential. But again, it's all potential. The jury's out there. It's a very expensive thing to do. The robot itself costs $2 million. There's maintenance and everything else that Dr. Fear talked about. But in, in what I've done since I've been doing robotic surgery since 2007, I can definitely say that picking the person is incredibly important. If somebody comes to my office and um, they need a hysterectomy, I don't automatically say, oh, well, let's just do it robotically, even if they're at a hospital where the platform exists. Um, insurance companies specifically, um, certain HMOs, I mean, they do dictate where patients go. So it's hard to explain to a patient that, oh, you have to have the robot because you don't. I mean, you can do it laparoscopically and do it at a hospital where it doesn't exist, but the potential benefits include what I've talked about, which is uh, cervical cancers, um, less than four centimeters, morbidly obese women that have endometrial cancer, the potential of um, prolapse surgery and endometriosis and uh, myomectomies. Um, I think that those are all arenas where, um, with further research, the robotic platform could be something that um, could be great.